Michael's life and Jeffrey Epstein's became intertwined in about the early 1990s. Recently, in 2022, Ghislaine was found guilty of five various counts of sex crimes and was ordered to pay a $750,000 fine, as well as serve a 20-year prison sentence. This was quite the transformation from the role she used to play as a high-born, beautiful, financially set, well-behaved daughter of a man like Robert Maxwell. In her youth, she had the resources and social status needed to possess and achieve anything her heart desired. And although her location and circumstances evolved as she grew, the privilege and entitlement remained the same for most of her life. That is, until it didn't. Dun, dun, dun. In 2022, at 60 years old, Ghislaine now has a very different lifestyle. And up until recently, she spent her days with Jeffrey Epstein, dating him, working for him, and just overall enjoying herself. Her favorite hobbies became photographing topless girls for her collection and exploiting young children and women with Jeffrey Epstein. As of June 2022, she lives in a maximum security metropolitan detention center in Brooklyn, New York. On Suicide Watch, Ghislaine often loses access to clothing, toothpaste, soap, legal papers, and pretty much all of her stuff. She's given a smock and the ability to request a few sheets of toilet paper as needed. Please, sir, may I have some toilet paper? About 5 feet 4 inches tall and approximately 140 pounds, her dark eyes and short black hair contrast with her fair sun-deprived skin due to often enduring minimal human interaction and outdoor recreational time. To ensure her safety, she is monitored by cameras at all times and then in person at regular intervals with guards repeatedly waking her up to confirm her well-being. As a convicted felon, Maxwell no longer has the right to privacy, freedom, or control over her life. How did Ghislaine's circumstances change so much over the years? It didn't happen overnight. Let's dive into her downfall and figure out where things went wrong and how she ended up where she is today. She was born Ghislaine Noel Marion Maxwell to Elizabeth and Robert on Christmas Day, 1961 in Mason's Lafayette, a northwest suburb of Paris, France, filled with mansions and palaces meant only for the exceptionally wealthy, proper gentlemen and ladies. In the commune, residents often took part in high-end private social events. They lived the old wealth 19th century lifestyle by participating in equestrian hobbies, enjoying luxurious golf courses, and utilizing the same vast natural parks royalty often used to hunt. Fate favored Ghislaine Maxwell from the day she was born, but it didn't end there. It was also her father's favorite. Even though Ghislaine grew up with her eight other siblings, including Anne, Christine, Ian, Isabel, Karen, Kevin, Michael, and Philip, she stole her father's heart when she came into this world. The Czechoslovakia-born businessman was born to Jewish parents who the Nazis likely killed and came to Britain penniless at age 16. From there, he built up one of the biggest media and publishing groups in the world, ensuring that his children never wanted for anything especially Ghislaine. Robert often called Ghislaine his favorite child and never failed to indulge his beautiful daughter, inadvertently spoiling her rotten. Later in life, he even purchased a luxury motor yacht and renamed it Lady Ghislaine to honor her. Although Ghislaine seemed to reciprocate her father's affection, his love could also be stifling at times as she grew into a young woman. Robert did not allow boyfriends to visit her, and then even barred her from being seen with them in public while attending college. It was also reported that he hid microphones to spy on his children. Decades later, one was found in an old lamp that used to reside in their home. As an adult, Ghislaine developed strong relationships with people like Jeffrey Epstein, but also a few others along the way. This included a seven-year relationship with the founder of Gateway Computers, Ted Wyatt, which started in 2003. The pair were seen attending high profile private events like the wedding of Chelsea Clinton in 2010 and was said to be on track for marriage. However, her previous association with Epstein ultimately killed the relationship when Miami lawyer Scott W. Rothstein attempted to blackmail Ted 
or $10 million to keep Ghislaine's name out of upcoming Epstein-related civil suits. In 2016, Ghislaine secretly married a man named Scott Borgensen, the multimillionaire CEO of a tech company and former Coast Guard officer. However, this was only revealed at the start of her trial in July 2020, and Scott denies their relationship, calling Ghislaine his friend rather than his spouse. Although details of their marriage are hazy at best, it is theorized that the two married to benefit from spousal privilege, which would prevent prosecutors from compelling Scott to testify against his wife. Regardless, as of November 2020, the two were reported to have broken up and filed for divorce after Scott dumped Ghislaine for a yoga teacher via a jail phone call just before the start of her trial. Hey, hey, Ghislaine, we have to talk. About what, honey? I've just had the worst day. I can't wait to hear what it is. I can really use the cheer up. Well, I don't think you're going to be happy with this conversation then. What do you mean, honey? I'm just so glad you've called. No one will talk to me these days. Well, that's the thing, honey. We won't be talking much longer. What do you mean, honey bunny Scott? I'm gone. We're finished. Finito. It's time to cut our losses. I found a yoga instructor. She's beautiful and she's better than you. Have a good life. Peace. Click. Robert supported his daughter by providing her with a $100,000 a year trust fund and helping her become a top socialite in New York by introducing her to prominent people. It was also reported that Robert had gifted Ghislaine a tailor-made New York company that manufactured corporate gifts. However, the venture was a failure. Ghislaine reciprocated the support by managing some of her father's assets, including serving as director of the Oxford United Football Club and becoming his representative and partner after he purchased the New York Daily News in January of 1991. On November 5, 1991, Robert used Ghislaine to do his bidding when he sent her to New York to deliver an envelope on his behalf. She had no idea it contained Robert's master plan to steal $200 million from shareholders. Hey, honey. Ghislaine, I need you to do something for me. Of course, anything for you, Daddy. I need you to take this envelope and deliver it. But I'm going to need you to fly to the United States. And, uh, just, um, don't open it, okay? Okay, Dad, because that's not weird. Sure. Not long after Robert's naked body was found in the sea off the Canary Islands after falling off his yacht, Lady Ghislaine. Although his death was ruled an accidental drowning caused by a heart attack, many people believe there is more to the story. His fraudulent business activity only became public after his death and Ghislaine was stuck dealing with the aftermath. She worked at a real estate office on Madison Avenue in New York while handling the pension scandal following his death. The death of her father massively impacted Ghislaine and many speculate it's what drove her into Epstein's arms. Shortly after, in 1992, she was hired to manage Epstein's six estates in exchange for a six-figure salary ranging from $100,000 to $200,000 a year. Luxury gifts like cars and a loan deal for her new townhouse. Her duties included with assisting, decorating his houses, and hiring and managing staff to help run those houses. This included scouting massage therapists for Epstein. As a socialite, Ghislaine often spent significant time attending fashionable social gatherings instead of traditional employment. Meaning she had fun instead of working. She attended events and socialized with chums like Kevin Spacey, Jean-Luc Brunel, Elon Musk, Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, Prince Andrew, Alan Dershowitz, and more. However, as the controversy and evidence mounted over the last decade, Maxwell retreated from social events and, in 2016, sold her New York townhouse for $15 million. In 2012, Maxwell focused her attention on philanthropy, founding the Terramar Project, a nonprofit organization advocating for the protection of the oceans. She gave lectures at the University of Texas at Dallas and a TED Talk at TEDx Charlottesville and accompanied a board member to two United Nations meetings. However, to this day, Ghislaine is most known for her sex crimes, which caused the project to end in 2019 
less than a week after sex trafficking charges were brought against Epstein. Now a convicted felon, her next job will most likely be assigned to her while in prison. It'll be tough, but every job has its cons. Get it? Eh, eh, cons? Ghislaine has an extensive criminal history spanning decades. She has been faced with an onslaught of accusations and civil suits on behalf of Virginia Gruffe in 2015, Sarah Ransom in 2017, Maria Farmer in 2019, Jennifer Arose in 2019, Jane Doe's 1 through 3 in 2019, Priscilla Doe in 2019, Jane Doe in 2020, and another Jane Doe in 2021. In 2015, a woman known as Jane Doe 3 sued Ghislaine in the Southern District of New York for forcing her to have sex with Epstein as well as forcing other minors into prostitution. The incident she was referring to took place in 1999. And then in 2018, this person, Jane Doe 3, was revealed to be Virginia Robert Gruffet. Virginia first met Ghislaine at Trump's Mar-a-Lago Club in Palm Beach, Florida in 1999. Virginia stated that Ghislaine had introduced her to Jeffrey and had later groomed her to be an escort. She had even told her about Jeffrey's preferences during oral sex. Virginia again accused Ghislaine of defamation after the latter called her a liar. The verdict was given in Virginia's favor after a lengthy legal procedure. However, the details of the settlement were never made public. We do know Ghislaine had to pay a monetary compensation to Virginia. In court, Virginia said, my world kind of spiraled after that. I stopped going on modeling castings. I gained weight. I became depressed. I stopped going out with my friends. And only five months after I had been in New York City to pursue my dream, I left. I left the modeling industry. I left New York City. And I totally switched my career path. In 2017, Glenn was again accused of forced prostitution by Sarah Ransom. She claimed that both Ghislaine and Epstein had threatened her when she didn't comply with Epstein's sexual preferences. The case was settled that year under undisclosed terms. Talking about? Um, Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein um, basically got another girl to recruit me and paid her um, to deliver me to Jeffrey. And what was, um, what was interesting for me was this was the first grooming stage was being targeted by a young woman my age. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anybody in New York. Mm. So just to have a girlfriend, just to have coffee with, to to walk her in the park with, a you know, friend. a yeah. friend, yeah. just a friend. And then, you know, so I had met her and then, you know, a few days afterwards, she phoned me up and said, you know what? I know a fantastic guy who, he's very charming, charismatic, and he really, likes, you know, he's a philanthropist and he really believes in young talent and I believe that you're really talented and you, you have so much to offer. And I was like, well, this is fantastic. It's a sophisticated operation. Mm -hmm. It was, it really? was, it was yes. so, I mean. And it's not unusual for sexual predators to, to employ those mm -hmm. sorts of tactics. Yeah. In a turnaround, on March 12, 2020, Ghislaine filed a lawsuit in Superior Court of the U.S. Virgin Islands requesting compensation from Epstein's estate to cover her legal fees. Maxwell claimed she had been a longtime employee of Epstein who had served to manage his property holdings in the U.S. Virgin Islands, New York, Mexico, Florida, and Paris, while continually to deny any knowledge or involvement in his criminal activities. According to the lawsuit, Maxwell was seeking damages for the legal fees associated with defending herself against her accusers, expenses that she claims Epstein had promised to cover for her. As of March 2022, she was still battling the courts about this matter. Um, hey, is this the Virgin Islands? Um, who is this? Glenn Maxwell. I was just wondering, um, could you give me some money? What? When FBI agents went to arrest Ghislaine Maxwell on the morning of July 2nd on a remote property in New Hampshire, they broke through her locked gate, approached the front door, and announced themselves, telling her to open the door. Through a window, the agents saw her ignore their order and flee to another room in the house, quickly shutting the door behind her. 
outnumbered and outmatched, she was arrested and charged with six counts. Hi everyone, I'm Phil Lipoff. We are coming on the air right now with breaking news. A verdict has been reached in the trial of Jeffrey Epstein's former confidant, Ghislaine Maxwell, longtime Epstein associate. And this verdict just came down. I want to bring in uh, ABC's Aaron Katursky, who joins us by phone. He was in the courtroom. Well, it, it all happened very fast. The jury took about 40 hours to deliberate this verdict, Phil, over the last six days. And tonight, Ghislaine Maxwell has been convicted of all but one charge that she faced. She once ran in the circles of presidents and princes. She turned 60 in jail Christmas Day, and now she is going to be uh, headed off to prison potentially for the next 65 years. In all likelihood... Aaron, 40 hours of deliberation. You have been following this case as closely as anyone else. Over the course of the last three days, the jury had been asking questions, asking to have testimony read back, even today from the pilot of Jeffrey Epstein's plane. Tell us a bit about what they asked for and what that meant to you leading up to this verdict. The jury was incredibly thorough. They asked for more than a third of the case. They asked for the, the transcripts of testimony by 13 of the witnesses, a third of the case. And so they, they went meticulously through all of the, the testimony of the accusers and then a number of the supporting characters, plus a couple of the witnesses called by the defense, including a defense expert who testified about the frailty of memory. That was part of the crux of the defense case, was that the, the, the whole case against Glenn Maxwell, the defense said, was based on, on made-up stories and the false memories of these accusers. But it appears the jury disagreed and believed the women who testified, including a woman, Jane, identified under a pseudonym, who said that she met Glenn Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein when she was 14 years old, beginning years of abuse. During Ghislaine's trial, the prosecution utilized a mix of evidence to prove their case, consisting of 24 witnesses, including former private pilots and household employees of Epstein's, a psychologist to speak as an expert witness on childhood sexual abuse, and four accusers. Through testimony, bolstered by birth certificates, flight logs, photographs, and floor plans of Epstein's various planes and properties, and other evidence, they were able to prove their case. On December 5th of 2021, Ghislaine was found guilty of five counts of various sex crimes. She was acquitted on one count of enticing a minor to cross state lines. She was then sentenced to a 20 year prison sentence and forced to pay a $750 fine. She'll also have to do five years of supervised release if and when she gets out. Just prior to being sentenced, she was given the opportunity to address the court. And she acknowledged the anguish and pain of her accusers. She said her biggest regret was ever meeting Jeffrey Epstein. And then in my opinion, she went on to give a very half-hearted, pathetic, narcissistic apology that didn't really take responsibility for any of her actions and instead just made her seem like more of a victim. And although she might be a victim, she was also an abuser and you can be a victim but still apologize for what you did wrong. As a survivor of Jeffrey Epstein, I do feel bad for the way that he exploited her um, I, I have a personal understanding of what predators like Epstein can have, that hold they can have over someone. However, unlike her victims, she had the status and resources to stand up to Epstein. If anyone's reputation, you know, she was a socialite, well-known and well-respected in many ways. And instead, she decided to lure other victims that she knew had no ability to, to get free. And I don't understand. I don't think that's right. She could have fought for justice or at the very least just left Jeffrey Epstein. Obviously he would have gone on and probably continued to do what he was doing. However, she played a part in his success. So at the very least, she could have removed herself from that equation. And I'm not saying she was always happy or things didn't happen, but as somebody who's researched her now and read lots of articles and seen lots of photos, she looked pretty happy to me the way she was holding him and hugging him and kissing him and rubbing his feet. And again, looks are deceiving. So, you know, you don't really know, 
but I don't know. To me, it kind of looked like she enjoyed her time with him and took advantage of all the things that he had to offer. Unfortunately, she had no problem introducing the vulnerable and young children even to Epstein, knowing that they had no, they weren't a match for her and him. There was nothing that they could do. There was no way out. She may have felt trapped, but that didn't give her the right to trap others. The night I was introduced to Jeffrey Epstein in a restaurant club in New York City, I can't say if it was definitely Ghislaine. However, there was a woman there, fitting her description basically. And whether she knew it or not, she played a role in how everything turned out for me. If it wasn't for her, I truly feel that Epstein wouldn't have been able to lure me the way he did and no less do what other people did. I met a girl during the first week of college, you know, and you're supposed to make friends. That's what you do. And I trusted her that she was just a nice person and she seemed endearing. And, you know, weeks later, she invited me to go to this club restaurant and I was nervous that I wouldn't even get in because I was only 18 and, you know, wasn't 21 and legal to drink. And then next thing I know, I'm standing in this, you know, club restaurant and I look around and there's all girls in this kind of semi-private area and they look younger than me. And I was worried about me, be, you know, being able to get in and here they are. And then there was this, you know, group of older men sitting together. And I remember my alarm bells kind of going off saying, well, you know, this is a little creepy that it's all young girls and old men. And then next thing I know, you know, a professional, attractive, older woman, she sat down with the older gentleman and it allowed me to justify things because then to me, it became a group of adults together, kind of hanging out and then a group of friends, young girls, which the person that introduced me to him made it seem like, you know, he was kind of an uncle type that took care of her. So it was like, all right, her and her friends and people are around. And then here's this group of adults and it justified it to me. And I thought everything was okay. And if it wasn't for her presence at that moment where I went, mm, creep, you know, creeple meter, it's not going well. Very well, might have just turned around and, and left. And my whole life would have been different. And it wasn't just that person. There were numerous times where women played a part in selling the lies. And as he groped me and basically sexually assaulted me that night, at that point at 18, I was naive and I thought that women protected other women, especially children and people that are vulnerable. And I learned a very hard lesson that night. I don't know. I, for one, am glad that she's in prison, and I hope it brings some peace and justice for her victims.